So we've been looking at Acts chapter 2, and we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and about the fact that, the, that, that through the Holy Spirit, God gives us power for a purpose. And today we're going to talk about being baptized with fire. John the Baptist had told everyone who came to see him that Jesus was actually the one they were really looking for. And he said, I'm baptizing you in water as a sign of repentance, but Jesus is going to baptize you in the Holy, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So I, wanted to, I, I tend to think about the Holy Spirit in that sentence and leave out fire. And we're going to talk about the fire today. When Jesus, after his resurrection, was taken up into heaven, he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then after receiving the Spirit, they were, he promised them that they were going to go out and tell his story to the ends of the earth. And of course, they waited, and they prayed, and this is what happened. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house that, where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So this is what happened after they waited and prayed. The Holy Spirit came on them. They heard the sound of wind. They saw what looked like fire and they they began to, to speak in languages that they didn't know. And we've been reading just this section for about three weeks. And while we're going through Acts 2, I'm asking all of us to pray. Please pray between now and Pentecost Sunday, June 5th, for a fresh outpouring of the Spirit on our church that would empower us for the mission of Jesus. So let's continue to pray for that. Whenever you think about it, when you're praying at home, pray that the Holy Spirit would come on our church in a new way and empower us to, to share the gospel and to invite people into the kingdom of God. So today we're going to look at this vision of fire that Jesus' followers experienced on this day. Um, so I'm going to take a minute to pray, and then we're going to dive in, and we're going to look at why is it that they saw fire, and what might that mean? So, Lord, we welcome you right now. Holy Spirit, would you come? Um, and we just audaciously pray that you would come and that you would baptize us with your spirit and that you would baptize us with fire. That you would meet us and that you would have your way with us. Would you help us to understand your scriptures? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want us to do today, actually, is look at the Hebrew scriptures where we repeatedly read about people seeing fire in association with God's active presence at specifically pivotal moments in the unfolding of God's rescue plan for humanity. And we're going to look at three of these moments in particular. There are many, but we're going to look at three in hopes of better understanding what was happening when Jesus' followers saw tongues of fire come to rest on each other. And the first one um, is a time when Abraham experienced seeing God as fire. So when God made a covenant with Abraham in the beginning of God's redemption plan for humanity, um, God spoke to Abraham, called him to leave his home, to travel to a new land that he's never been to, promised him that he would have many, many descendants, as numerous as the stars. And he promised him that after a period of enslavement, his descendants would escape with great possessions and live in the land that was promised to Abraham that would come to be known as Israel. And that it would be through these people descended from Abraham that God's rescue plan, that is Jesus, would come to us. Now, interestingly, Abraham, the, the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God about the many children. 
which is kind of amazing. Abraham and Sarah were getting pretty old, and God says that they have no biological children, and God tells them they're going to have biological children as numerous as the stars, and Abraham actually believes this. But he had a really hard time believing that God was going to give his family the land that was promised. And so he says, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? And so God seals his promise through a ritual that seems a little strange to modern day readers. He had Abraham collect a number of different animals and cut them in half. And then he puts half of the animal on this side and half of the animal on that side and lines them all up. So you've got two rows of animal halves. Um, it's a little gruesome. Um, but the expectation was that the person making the promise would walk down the middle between the animal carcasses as a way of saying, let this be what would happen to me if I were to ever break my promise. If I break this covenant, let me be just cut in half like these dead animals. Um, now, normally, it was the weaker party in the arrangement that had to do this. So, you know, one person has, has conquered and taken control of, of another group of people. One group of people has taken control of another group of people. And the, the people who are subservient to the higher, to the, to the bigger power, they're the ones who, you know, are under the threat of death. And they walk between the animal carcasses and really think about the fact that this much bigger, stronger person has the capacity to actually do this to them should they fail to keep their end of the deal. But something actually incredibly unusual happens in this particular case. You would think that God would make Abraham promise to obey him and walk between the animal carcasses. But instead we read this. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. So the fire that Abraham saw was a visual representation of God as God made this binding promise to Abraham. God was the one who said, you know, let me be killed and torn apart if I don't keep this promise. I absolutely will, no matter what, keep this promise to you, Abraham, that your children will enter into the promised land. And it was this image of fire that that represented God, that Abraham was able to see as God walked between the pieces. Now, we who are in Jesus have come to understand that we are Abraham's children. That not just those who are biologically descended from Abraham, but those who put their hope and trust in the Lord the way that Abraham did. Those who have left behind everything that we once knew to follow after God's plan for our lives and God's rescue plan for humanity, uh, to become part of God's family and be part of his plan for blessing and healing of the whole earth. We who are in Jesus, we are Abraham's children. And though it did come true that Abraham's biological children were enslaved in Egypt, just as God had said, and then escaped with great possessions, just as God, as God had said, and then conquered the land that God had promised them, just as God had said. We've also come to understand that this escape from slavery that God was talking about was bigger than that, was more than that. And this entering into the beautiful land of promise is also bigger than that. These moments when these things happened in the lives of, it, of the Israelites were a foreshadowing of a much greater escape from slavery to sin, to Satan, to death. Um, 
And the entry into the promised land was a foreshadowing of a much greater entry into paradise, into new life, eternal life, eternal wholeness. And we might find ourselves as those who have received this promise that we are going to be, that we are being set free and that we are entering in and will enter in to a, a place and a time of beauty and joy and love and peace for eternity with God. We might ask, just as Abraham did, how can we know that this is really true? How can I know that Jesus will actually take me with him into eternal life? Well, Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. So the Holy Spirit that appeared again as fire when it came down on the disciples is once again the seal of God's promise, God's guarantee. Just as the fire Abraham saw that represented the active presence of the living God was the guarantee of God's promise to Abraham, baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire is a deposit guaranteeing the promise of eternal life in Jesus. That is, it's a little bit of eternal life for us to hold on to. Right? You can think of a deposit as like a down payment. It's, it's, the, it's the money that we put down to hold something that, that we are promising to, to pay for in full later. Right? So this is that little bit of God's promise of life and eternity and wholeness, goodness, and intimate relationship with God that promises us that the complete fulfillment is in fact coming. You know, we talked about last week how we can expect to experience something noticeable when the Holy Spirit comes on us, when the Holy Spirit comes and fills us. And we talked about it's not always the same. It's not always a really big feeling. It's different from, from one person to another. One person might speak in tongues like we see in the book of Acts and another person might not. But we should all expect to actually experience something that we can notice when the Holy Spirit comes on us. And one of the reasons that this matters is that part of Jesus' purpose in sending us the Spirit is to give us this assurance that he's really coming back for us. The presence of the Holy Spirit in us should be an assurance. We should be able to, to reach back to that place and say, yes, I know that Jesus is coming for me because I have his Holy Spirit in me. Now, that doesn't mean that we never experience doubts. I am a world-class doubter. I've told you that a million times. Um, so many times the thought crosses my mind, you know, what if all this Jesus stuff really is just a fairy story? You know, what if there's nothing at all when we die except eternal loss of consciousness and our bodies rotting in a hole somewhere? You know, but you know what I remember in those moments when I have those doubts? Because like I said, I'm a huge doubter. I doubt everything all the time. But what I remember is how much my life has changed. I remember how fearful I used to be around other people. I remember a time when I was afraid to speak, when I couldn't make a telephone call. Um, I remember how hopeless and lonely I felt, a, a time when it just seemed like nothing was ever going to turn out well for me. I remember a time when ordinary activities like brushing my teeth or eating lunch just seemed too hard. Like so hard that actually, you know, it really severely damaged my teeth and, and a number of days went by that I just didn't bother to eat. Um, and when I think about this, I realize all over again that there is one thing that I know for sure. 
one thing in this life that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, something happened to me. Now, when I asked Jesus to come into my life, something changed. And, and it feels different inside to be me. I feel alive in a way that I never felt before. I'm able to do things that I could never have done before. Like talk in front of people. <laughs> like finish projects I start. Like brush my teeth every day. Um, I've become an entirely different person. And this started to happen when I turned my life over to Jesus. When the Holy Spirit came and took up residence inside me. That's the deposit. Now, those experiences of transformation, those experiences of God's presence with us, that knowing that the Holy Spirit is in us and with us, that's the deposit on eternal life. We experience now just a foretaste, just a little bit of all of the good things that are going to come. Now I want to look at a second image from the Old Testament when, the, when God's active presence is represented by fire. So we're going to look at an encounter that Moses has where God speaks to him from a bush. So many, many generations after Abraham and after Abraham's descendants had been enslaved and all these things had come true, we read again about the fire representing God's active presence, God comes and speaks to Moses while the people are enslaved in Egypt and commissions him as an agent that God will use to free the people from slavery and bring them into the promised land. Exodus chapter 3 begins, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And then when Moses approaches the bush, God speaks to him from the bush that appears to be burning and tells him that the time has come. So this is another pivotal moment. Like when God made the promise to Abraham in the beginning that after this period of slavery, they would go into the promised land. Here's another pivotal moment. God says, I'm going to use you to set my people free. I'm going to use you as my agent for deliverance. And I'm going to give you the power to perform these miraculous signs. So here we're coming to the fulfillment of the first part of this promise. And once again... God's spatial presence is marked out by the appearance of fire. And once again, there are very clear connections to this moment and what we see happening at Pentecost. So Pentecost was also a day of commissioning and also a day of empowering for setting people free from slavery. You remember that Jesus had promised that when the Holy Spirit came, his followers would receive power. And it's power for a very specific purpose, so that they could bring his message and his freedom to the whole world. We read in Acts chapter 1 a couple weeks ago, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And this is exactly what happened. They saw the Spirit coming on them like fire, and then they found that they had the, the power to perform miraculous signs, to heal sicknesses, to heal injuries, to know things that no one had ever told them, to speak the heart of God into people's life situations, and so much more. And this all happened in conjunction with telling people that the kingdom of God was arriving, that the time that God would make things right is upon us, that Jesus had broken the power of the evil one to hold us down, and to lead us into sin and death, and that Jesus is inviting people instead into freedom and to life. So a couple things. Baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire is a commissioning and an empowering for the greatest slave revolt in the history of the world. 
for bringing freedom, healing, and transformation into people's lives as we spread the good news about Jesus and the coming of God's kingdom. It makes me think about uh, the good news that we had last week. You know, we, we prayed for Ahmed, um, Preston Mersal's brother, to be freed from imprisonment, and he was, right? That's the Holy Spirit empowering us in prayer to literally set captives free. And when we pray for physical and emotional healing, this is the same this is the same power of God to set the captives free. Rachel was just telling us a story before the service about a, a deaf person who was prayed for and was healed. And I didn't hear the beginning of the story. I got to ask Rachel for the rest of the story later because it sounds very exciting. Ask Rachel because it sounded like a great story and I only heard the end of it. But, but you know, a, a wonderful story of someone who couldn't hear and was healed uh, by the Holy Spirit. Amazing. And, and many of us have wonderful, wonderful stories of how God has brought healing and transformation into our lives. This is the Holy Spirit using us to set the captives free. We're going to look at one more, a third image of God's active presence as fire. And this is the, the pillar of fire that the people of Israel saw as they were journeying through the desert. So getting back again to the story of the Hebrew scriptures, once Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt, where they had been slaves, they went on a journey through the desert to the promised land. And on that journey, God was actively present with them, guiding them by a cloud that was lit at night by what appeared to be once again, fire. On the day of the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant law was set up. The cloud covered it. So this cloud had been there before when they built a place for God's presence. They built a house, basically, for God to come and live in. But it was a mobile house. It was a tent for God's presence to come and dwell in. And when they built this, this cloud that they had been seeing came and covered the tent. And from evening until morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked once again like fire. And this is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. And whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. And whenever the cloud settled, they encamped. So, so this cloud was over the tent when they were supposed to stay in one place. And they knew this is where God is spatially present with us. God actually went on the journey with his people and was spatially present in that tent with his people. And when God wanted them to move, that cloud lifted and traveled. And we read that they could travel in the daytime or the nighttime. So sometimes this cloud actually lifted at night while it looked like fire. And they would follow the fire to where it is that God wanted them to go. God personally guided his people on the journey to the promised land. And this vision of fire once again indicates God's active presence. Now, not surprisingly, we read in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit, whose presence had the appearance of fire at Pentecost, is given to us as a guide showing how to live out our freedom. I'm going to read you a bit of a, a longer chunk here from Galatians. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So once again, this is instructions on how to be free. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So here's how to be free. Live in love. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walking by the Spirit is the same thing as living in love. The Spirit will show us how to love. The Spirit will show us how to be free. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, 
so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, then you're not under the law. So this is really complicated. This is a pretty long, complicated thing. But, the, but you are no longer a slave, either to sin or to death or to Satan, but also to the law. We're not slaves to a bunch of rules that we are out there trying to follow. Instead, we are living according to love and according to the Spirit. And the Spirit is what teaches us to love and, and shows us each step of the way how to go. So this is, this is complicated, but the simple point is that in order to live out the freedom that we've been given as we carry on the mission of Jesus and wait for him to come and take us into eternity, the Spirit is going to show us how to live. Not as slaves to sin, not as slaves to a set of rules, but how to live according to the love of God. And we see in other passages that the Spirit speaks to Jesus' followers about how to get along with each other in specific situations, how to love each other in this particular case. Um, also about where to go next and who to talk to next about the message of Jesus. So baptism with the Spirit and with fire is God coming to be with us as counselor and guide. So, so far we've talked about a number of ways that God's presence by the Holy Spirit in the life of believers behaves similarly to the presence of God seen as fire in the Old Testament. But there's actually one really, really big difference. So far we've been talking about ways that this is the same. Oh, this is a way that God seals a promise. Oh, this is the way that God commissions us for the work of freedom. This is the way that God empowers us for the work of freedom. And this is also the way that God leads us along the way. So these are all ways that, that, that the Holy Spirit as fire is the same as what we see in the Old Testament. But there's one way that's so different. In all these Old Testament stories that we read, people see fire and interact with God through that vision. But they're never baptized in it. Nothing like the baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptism with fire, happens in the Old Testament. People see the fire over there, between the animal halves, on the bush, above the tabernacle, out in front of them. And God communicates with them through it. But here in Acts, the fire is on the people. God's presence isn't over there. God's present, presence isn't in a vision of a torch. God's presence isn't in a bush. God's presence isn't in the distance calling us to come and follow. God's presence isn't in a tent that only a few special people can go inside of. So the vision of fire that the people see on the day of Pentecost, it still indicates the place of God's active spatial presence. Just as it did in all of these other events. But where is the fire on the day of Pentecost? The fire is over the people. Just as the fire once rested above the tabernacle, which was God's dwelling place when he went to accompany his people, the fire now rests on the people of Jesus. God's active living presence has come to live inside of us. And this is entirely new. Jesus has indeed baptized them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And this isn't just for them. Okay? It's not just for this room full of the first believers. But it's for all of us who are in Jesus. And, and this coming of the Holy Spirit to live within the people of Jesus ushers in an entirely new way that God relates to humanity. So baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire is God personally taking up residence 
within the people of Jesus. And one of the ways that we see the presence of God within the people right away is that just as Moses heard the voice of God coming from the bush, and he and the rest of the people actually heard the voice of God speaking from the cloud at one point. Uh, the disciples now heard the voice of God speaking to them from each other. And even speaking out of their own mouths, they heard the voice of God speaking from within them. They heard the voice of God speaking from the other people in the room with them. And not just the disciples present in the room, but the people all around them heard this too. And we too experience the same thing, which we're going to talk about more next time. But I, I think that most of us, I would say including me, drastically underestimate how big of a deal it is to be the actual physical dwelling place of God himself. To be the place on the earth where God actively lives and is presently at work. To call people into covenant with himself. To do miraculous works of healing and transformation. To bring freedom from all kinds of oppression and from compulsive behaviors. To personally guide us into the way to live. Show us the things that God wants us to do. I think that we drastically underestimate this. To think that God is actually, actively alive and within us. That spirit marks the place. That, that fire marks the place of God's spirit, which is here in us. I'm out of words to say how amazing that really is. I feel like I'm just standing here wanting to tell you what it means, but just feeling like all I can do is just grasp at something that I can't take a hold of myself. But I want us to spend a second time in small group discussion. Before we go to small group, I'm gonna just give you a minute to think about this for yourself, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. How would your life change if you really believed that you were the physical place of God's active living presence and power in the world? How would your life change if you really, really believed that that was true? And give us just a minute to think about that. We talked for a little while about this kind of went with confidence, but... It, just a, a note before saying that, I'm noticing the same thing this week that I noticed last week, which is so often I hear things from groups that didn't come up in my group, and I think, oh, wow, I never thought about that. And as we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, I'm hearing, like, oh, my goodness, all of our groups had the same conversation. <laughs> you know, all these, we all talked about all the same things. Um, and that, that's, it's just interesting to me this is that, that that's what's happening. Um, but one thing we talked about in our group related to confidence was wow, we would, just, we would just imagine that our presence was a blessing. You know, that, that, you know, that people would feel you know, loved and important and special and wonderful um, you know, because we were there. And then we added that, that that would have to be if we were actually walking in step with the Spirit. If we weren't actually walking in step with the Spirit, people might not feel like that at all. But I, I want to leave us here and I want to spend some time, just as we did last week, praying for the Holy Spirit to come.